Welcome to the discussion. My guests today are Brian Rosenstiel, a cybersecurity architect for public sector at Cisco, Rob Hankinson, the acting director of the Office of Information Technology Infrastructure at the Department of State, Rob Birchmeyer, the identity credential and access management lead at the Marshall Space Flight Center for NASA, Jordan Burris, the chief of staff in the Office of the Federal CIO in the Office of Management and Budget, and Sam Youssef, the deputy director of the Defense Manpower Data Center in the Defense Department. Gentlemen, welcome to the discussion. Let me set just a little bit of context for our discussion. Few would argue that the pandemic was the killer app for identity management and the move towards zero trust. With upwards of 85% or more of federal employees working remotely, the threat surface expanded, making identity and access management much more critical for agencies as they met their missions. Over the course of the last 12 months, agencies have figured out how to issue smart identity cards using drive credentials. GSA and the Postal Service are entering into a second 90-day phase of a pilot to offer employees an alternative to going to an office or a credentialing facility to obtain new or updated identity cards. With the success over the last 12 months, agencies now need the policy that underpins these successes to catch up. NIST is moving in that direction with an update to FIPS 201-3. OMB updated its ICAM policy in 2019, emphasizing the need for each agency to have a single ICAM policy and connect it to architectures, policies, and standards. Now, all of these efforts are helping to unlock the potential of new and emerging approaches to authenticate users. And this also opens the door further to more advanced implementations of zero trust architectures and for agencies to take a more risk-based approach to cybersecurity. So how can agencies move toward a seamless and frictionless experience for employees and citizens while also moving away from static policies and frameworks? Well, that's what our panelists are going to help us understand. Gentlemen, let me to maybe turn to Sam Yusuf from the Defense Manpower Data Center to start. DOD has been a leader with identity and access management. You all were, you, you put the identity and identity management probably back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and really you've been building on it. Walk me through the current approach to identity and access management at DOD and how has it evolved specifically over the last year? Yeah, uh, thanks for that comment, Jason. We, we certainly feel like we've always been at the tip of the spear when it comes to identity management and our work on uh, the smart card and uh, common access card. Uh, at Defense Manpower Data Center, we uh, operate the uh, personal data repository for all of DOD. And in that we uh, have over 50 million identities that we manage for the department. Uh, and with that, uh, we enable our common access card program, which we manage and our uh, uniform services identification card program, which is also out of the Defense Manpower Data Center. Uh, and with those two credentialing programs combined, we're talking about over 11 million cards in circulation uh, that we use to enable access to our networks, military installations, and equally as important uh, benefits and entitlements for our service members and their families. Uh, and, and I mentioned that really because uh, the identity strategy at DOD has always focused on that tip of the spear uh, war fighting mentality. Uh, and then on the other side of the fence, you know, taking care of our veterans and our retirees, ensuring they can get uh, access uh, at the right time uh, seamlessly, but also, as we know in ICANN, ensuring that it's uh, not access in perpetuity, right? It's, it's access uh, leading to that zero trust framework and, and making the right authorization decisions. And, and we also know too well in the Department of Defense you know, when we don't have the identity framework uh, to support those access, uh, we're putting our installations at risk and our people at risk. You brought up a couple of key words that I'm sure we'll get back to during our conversation today, zero trust framework, identity underpinning that. Have you seen an evolution over the past, you know, 12 months with identity and access management at DOD because of the pandemic or just because it was time to, to evolve? Hey, yeah, absolutely. I think there was a, a common synergy there, right? We're, we had the snowball rolling and then the pandemic hit and it, it helped uh, kick, kick us into further action. And a, a couple of those things are, are, have been highlighted too in a DOD's data strategy, right? Getting to a, a data centric environment and, and really the, the ICAM is, is kind of the underpinnings of that as we can uh, 
get more mature with our backend infrastructure and making our attributes available across the enterprise, uh, we, we single-handedly can uh, make those authorization decisions uh, much more seamlessly. So I, I'm very excited actually with the momentum we have in the department. Uh, this has been something uh, that's been championed at the Deputy Secretary of Defense level uh, when we talked about ICANN in the previous administration, and we're seeing that momentum just carry uh, in this administration. And, and with that, you know, again, it, it, it goes back to greater focus on uh, the capabilities that we're able to provide. And, and there's a, a couple of things that um, I'll, I'll get into more later, but as we focus on uh, providing digital identities and digital ID cards, so we don't have to bring in uh, our 7 million uh, beneficiary veteran population into ID card centers, right? Which is also important uh, during this time period. And the ability to uh, remotely uh, renew cards and have them pre-positioned. So these are all areas we're getting a lot of energy behind uh, that has been kind of catapulted by the last 12 months. Let me turn to Rob Birchmeyer from NASA. NASA, I remember years ago, Rob, when I was covering the early times of HSPD-12, NASA was always ahead of a lot of other agencies. Walk me through your identity and access management strategy today and, and how's it evolved? So, I mean, very similar to what uh, Sam was saying. We, we had uh, been looking at ways to do remote enrollments and, and things that, you know, are, because of the pandemic have become pretty much essential. It's hard to get people to come into a NASA center when we're on lockdown. And it's, you know, we've been able to maintain that over the past year. But we have been looking for the past several years and worked with GSA, like you mentioned. Uh, they're doing their pilot with the post office now. Um, we've met with some other companies uh, in the last six months who actually work with TSA and have infrastructure at all the airports as a potential way to, to get that uh, initial enrollment in for uh, the PIV badges that, that we want to issue. So um, this, is a, this is a problem we've been trying to solve for the past, I think, probably three, four years because um, we've had instances where Folks are in Colorado and can't get to a NASA center because we're not in every state like the post office or, or airports are. So that has our, been our main focus. And we're trying to come up with uh, yeah, new and innovative ways to actually be able to get those enrollments done. We did change our uh, renewal process so that you know the finalization of the badge, which is a technically uh, is typically done in person where you come in and you uh, put your fingerprints in and, and enter your pin and all that to finalize the badge. We did come up with a way uh, to do that remotely for the users when for just reissuance so uh, they do it using a team session and all that so that they can you know the actual user finalizes the badge and the badging official doesn't know the the pin number but then we mail it to them and then they can continue to use it so we we did some some things to enable those but there is that big problem space of the remote enrollment and the getting the i9 docs and all those things that we're hoping uh, the update to the uh, FIPS documents will assist in that. It's uh, interesting that you all uh, it, are moving down this path very similar to, to where GSA and the Postal Service, that pilot, which is just in that DC metro area. But I know from talking to them, they're looking at, okay, what can we learn from this pilot and where and how quickly can we expand it? In the meantime, you know, have employees new to NASA or needed, needed to re-up their badge? What have they been doing? Mostly it's been you mentioned the online piece for a reissuance, but what about new employees? What, what have they done over the pandemic? Yeah, new employees, we still require them to come in because of the, I mean, that's the requirement. We can't, we can't get around that. So um, we, uh, the badging uh, offices at the different centers, and then we've got like uh, 12 or 13 of them around the, the country. Uh, they set up a schedule, you know, people come in and they're very, uh, it, I think it's evolved better over the past several months as far as, you know, the, it, it was very hard to get them to come in, people to come in, but I think people become more comfortable with, you know, with policies of wearing masks and washing your hands and stuff to where they're, they're more comfortable doing it. So um, we, we still require them to actually do the in-person for the, for the initial visit. So Rob, we'll talk more later about the kind of how the identity management piece fits into applications and, and make sure the mission side and security. But let me turn to Jordan from OMB. Jordan, you can look at this from a very much broader level. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about the identity management policy at OMB, but, but what are you seeing across the government? What are some of those trends about identity and access management that you would highlight that really have popped up, that really have really become more prominent 
over the, over the last year. Uh, thanks, Jason. And first, thanks for having me. Uh, from OMB's perspective, you know, one thing that we're seeing is really just a continued push to accelerate efforts um, for establishing and maturing identity capabilities. You know, when we put out the, the memo in 1917, our intent was to reframe how we approached identity management, right? Taking a look at all lever or all layers of that, not only the governance aspect, but also architecture and how we were designed, confirming that we had appropriate roles and responsibilities defined for pushing this forward and that we were really looking at this in terms of not only what we're doing for the enterprise, what we're doing for the public. I can tell you that from you know, our engagement with the agencies and you know, looking across the board, we see that over the last year, there has just been that continued push. Much of this started you know, four years ago, right? When, as we were going through the process of updating the memo across agencies, but I think you know, things like the pandemic just further emphasized the need uh, for digital identity. And then more importantly, I think it's, it's now culturally becoming understood that it is the underpinning or the foundational element for how we deliver services, especially in a digital environment. Uh, and so you know, we're excited to see the progress and look forward to continue working with the agencies uh, as they go forward. I think, I think you make a great point when you talk about the, the underpinning and foundational element for delivering services. So much of that has come into play over the last 12 months. Do you get a sense that agencies, the acceleration we hear a lot about VPNs and move to the cloud and, and the application you know, modernization and all that that happened during the pandemic was identity also another piece that was accelerated, meaning we know about the digital signatures. That's a great story, right? What, what, what have we been waiting for, right, Jordan, for the last 25 years to do digital signatures? Oh, a pandemic. But that's that's one great example of the acceleration. Are you seeing other areas? Yeah, ab absolutely. So uh, when we talk about, you know, the, they were, you know, Rob and Sam were both talking about operating in a remote environment. One thing that we have been seeing is more pushes towards uh, accelerating progress or making it easier for the public to engage in digital services. And, and so uh, one thing we, you know, coming out of the Social Security Administration, right, there's a number of efforts that they're doing to help make it easier for, you know, their users in order to get accounts and be able to access things that otherwise they would have to go in person to do, right? A number of agencies, you know, you talked about GSA and the Postal Service, one of the things we recognized, especially as the government was flipping to maximum telework, was that we needed to make sure that we were reducing exposure and risk to, to the public and the employees and contractors that work in the government. So there has been kind of this, this whole community effort in order to make sure that, you know, we're using digital identity practices to the fullest extent possible to make it easier to do the work that we have to do at the end of the day, right? New credentials are being issued, services are being stood up, we're reframing how we might approach collaboration tools uh, and making sure that we're doing more to, you know, leverage identity really as that core enabler for driving our, our missions forward. I, uh, I think those are great examples and we'll have to follow up with SSA if we can uh, get them to uh, talk to us a little bit. Uh, let me move over to Rob from the State Department. Now, Rob, you guys at the State Department have a different perspective, uh, very similar to DOD with people all over the world, but sometimes you, you're dealing with parts of the world that has not necessarily great network connections. Identity is gonna play a bigger role because of other threats. Walk me through how the State Department's identity and access management strategy has evolved over the last year or so? So the, the strategy really hasn't evolved over the last year at all. It's been compressed and accelerated quite a bit as, as others have mentioned. Uh, we started down a, a enterprise access management solution about three or four years ago. Uh, we started with a tiger team of, of all of our regional and functional bureaus from across the Department of State. Uh, and if you know anything about the Department of State, all of our IT services don't rest under one house. We have a bunch of individual bureaus that kind of have their own little silos. And we've been working for years to collapse and consolidate those, uh, but we just weren't there yet. So we had bureaus with individual needs and requirements and varying degrees of their own access management solutions, their own identity providers. Uh, so when we started through this effort about three years ago, we brought them in and we talked about what their needs were and what where they saw their, their uh, where their systems were going and, and where they were going to need to be in the future. So we went through, I believe it was uh, 10 different products uh, through, through this Tiger team, evaluated. We had the companies come in, talk about their strengths and their weaknesses. Uh, and we settled on a, uh, our, our solution back at that time. It was a very 
uh, versatile solution. Uh, and it was the right solution for the Department of State. Fast forward to the beginning of COVID, we, we implemented that solution. We were, we were slowly rolling people on. Um, we don't have a strong uh, telework culture at the Department of State. We, we come into the office and we do our job and we leave, you know, we've got consular affairs issuing passports. And these are sort of things you've got to do in person. Uh, very, very few uh, could actually do the job outside. On any given day, we, we would have, you know, 2,000 people teleworking and that would be about it. And that's not a lot after uh, with 120 some thousand users globally around the world. So the COVID has really changed our culture significantly over the last year, uh, quickly ramping up to uh, expand remote telework services uh, has, has really changed our culture. Uh, we we are, are now bringing on more and more applications where before it was kind of a slow roll, we slowly kind of brought people in and and converted over the individual bureaus applications as they saw fit, as attrition helped. Um, but when COVID hit, they, we didn't, we didn't, we weren't capable of doing that anymore. We we couldn't take our time anymore. We we really there was an explosion of bringing uh, the different applications and the users on into this this one instance that uh, has has now just grown and grown, and and we look forward to building off of that. Uh, we we've had huge pilots uh, for stepping into zero trust. Uh, environments. We haven't gone to, we haven't piloted a complete zero trust solution yet, but we've got a different pilots going on that test different capabilities with that. Uh, and we really look forward to the day that we can, we can leverage zero trust technology completely. And I believe Sam said that identity is the uh, underpinning for zero trust. Uh, so we're, we're getting there. And this, this provided us that push that we needed uh, to get to that zero trust infrastructure. And we could talk a little bit more later about our plans and, and how that's gonna be an absolute game changer for the Department of State and saving costs and, and improving security. Rob, I have plenty more questions for you, but let me jump over to Brian real quick to get him in the segment here. Brian's been very patient. Brian, let's react to what you've heard from, from the panel so far. Uh, there seems to be some common themes. No, absolutely. You know, and, and these themes are what I've heard throughout, not just, you know, with our speakers here today, but, uh, through everyone that I've talked to throughout the federal government. You know, identity didn't change with COVID. In fact, it, it never really has changed going back to the earliest days of identity management. I think what changed was our understanding of what identity actually meant. The, the you know, uh, Jordan said it best when he talked about digital identity. When we, were, you know, really embraced and understood digital identity was beyond just the person behind the keyboard. It was everything involved within that authentication request. And we took a lot of that for granted. Uh, you know, before COVID, you know, as, as Rob was saying, people went to work, they went into the office. There was a lot of perimeter security, you know, that, that existed that we could use to, to establish that initial trust and, and just allow that authentication to proceed. When we moved to a telework environment, um, that changed the game. We suddenly had to start saying, okay, well, what, what device are they using to authenticate with and, and, and what authenticator are they using and where is that authenticator reside? And let's think about what kind of flexibility we're going to need even within our ident identity proofing, but also within the credentials we allow to access our, our uh, networks and resources and applications. And that expanded our view and understanding of identity in general. So yeah, absolutely. The, these common themes have been, I think, central to the, the what I would say overwhelmingly successful response to a significant change that I think people thought may happen, but certainly no one thought would happen to the extent it did and, and for the duration it has. All right, plenty to follow up with you as well, but let's take a quick break. When we come back, we can continue our conversation. You're listening to the panel discussion, the future of identity, credential and access management in government sponsored by Duo Security on Federal News Network. <laughs> 